Okay, so today I'm going to talk about economic freedom. And it's actually a relatively new concept in economics, believe it or not, in terms of being measured and applied through statistical analysis to find out you know, what's the impact of economic freedom on all these various measures of well-being. So um, it's only about 20 years that economists have been trying to kind of define it, measure it, apply it. So it's actually a relatively new concept, but I think a very important one and worthy of a lot more research than we've done so far. So I think it's always good to start like with a definition of it. So I'm going to start with a very academic. So what is economic freedom? It's the right of each individual to pursue his or her self-interest through voluntary exchange of private property under a rule of law that protects person and property. So that's a mouthful, but essentially it's a right, an individual right, to exchange property under voluntarily, mutually acceptable terms and um, know that there's some form of rule of law there to protect that exchange and those rights going forward. So in a nutshell, what it is, is the right of an individual to keep what they earn and choose how to spend their earnings. So in a pure economic freedom sense, no taxation. That's pure economic freedom. The right to produce what you want in accordance with your own values. So you can choose what goods and services you want to produce and how you want to produce them what resources and inputs you want to combine to produce. Again, that's pure economic freedom. And then the right to compete in the product and labor markets of your choosing. So there would be no artificial impediments to you entering a particular industry or uh, choosing an occupation, for example, no occupational licensing and things like that. With the restriction, of course, that you can't use force or fraud to further your ends. So this is essentially the working definition of economic freedom that I've used in the past and other scholars have used to then do more applied work. So how do we measure it? Now there's about five different indexes out there that measure economic freedom. Two of them measure it at the national level. So they look at um, economic freedom between countries at the national level. One is the Index of Economic Freedom done by the Heritage Foundation, and then the Fraser Institute in Canada does one called the Economic Freedom of the World. And I mean, they're somewhat similar. They, they vary a little bit in terms of what, what data they use to measure things. And then there's also a group that measure state economic freedom across US states. And there's, a, Fraser does one, it's called Economic Freedom of North America is they also do the provinces of Canada and then the US states. And then there's freedom in the 50 states. Um, that's more of a, a more recent one. I think they've only done about three or four editions of that by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. And then there's the one that I did, which is the superior index, of course. Uh, it's called the US Economic Freedom Index. And I did that when I was at PRI. And, um, now that I left PRI, unfortunately, it's not being done anymore. But, um, but I think um, all three of these are worthy of consideration. You know, and I would encourage all of you to Google them and look them up. But let's look at the, the national one that looks at economic freedom across countries. So this might be kind of hard to see, but the darker the green, the more free. And red is the worst. So. As you can see, the US is free, but it's not in the freest category, believe it or not. In the most recent ranking of economic freedom of, of the world, the US comes in 12th. And it's been in a pretty much a free fall since the early 2000s. It reached its peak in late 1990s. Um, we came in fourth freest, so we were in the, the freest category. But now we're in a, a level right below that called mostly free. So, um, so we're no longer one of the top 10. We're the 12th freest in the world. 
Um, anybody want to take a guess as to, without having Googled it, um, to guess who's one, two, or three? Nope, nope, nope. Australia's one, yeah, the third. Hong Kong's one. And Hong Kong and Singapore are one and two. They go back and forth, back and forth. So they're usually always one or two. Um, and like I said, we're, we were at four. That was the best we ever were. This was late 1990s. This is right after um, the Clinton welfare reform that was passed. So I think that had a major impact in terms of our, our ranking. And then also, you know, we were paying down the debt at that point at an incredible rate. So I think that helped us as well. But the Heritage Foundation, they look at 10 freedoms, they call them, and they're kind of, they're laid out there along the, along the bottom. Um, but they look at things like business freedom, trade freedom, you know, quotas and tariffs, fiscal freedom, so that would be taxes and spending, um, monetary freedom, so what kind of, you know, central bank or monetary regime that they have, investment freedom, so that would include things like capital controls, how easy you can move money into a country or take money out, um, financial freedom, property rights, of course, you know, how secure property rights are or are they subject to, you know, random or arbitrary confiscation of property? Um, freedom from corruption and labor freedom, so the labor laws. So it's very comprehensive, and unfortunately, you know, the, the U.S. has been falling rapidly in the last few years. Now, now in terms of the state level, the U.S. states, this is based on, you know, the index that I did at PRI, the U.S. Economic Freedom Index. So we started with 109 different state level variables and then we pared that down because there was a lot of redundancy and kind of overlap of the variables. So we got it down to 47 variables. And I'm going to go through this kind of quickly because this is kind of gets into the weeds in terms of how we construct it. But I think it would be just kind of helpful to kind of see how we did this. But, um, but 47 different variables that we based our index on. So it includes things like tax rates, state spending, occupational licensing, environmental regs, uh, welfare, income redistribution, uh, right to work, prevailing wage laws, minimum wage laws, um, number of government agencies, tort laws, that sort of thing. So we tried to come up with a very comprehensive measure of how much government actions within a state either further economic freedom or restrict or impede economic freedom. Then we crunched the numbers, 47 variables for each state. We grouped the variables within these five different sectors, so fiscal, regulatory, welfare, government size, judicial. The number in parentheses equals how many variables are within each of those sectors. So it's kind of similar to how Heritage does it, you know, they divide it into various sectors. Then we calculated a, um, with the, each sector for each variable, we ranked all 50 states for each variable from one being freest to 50 being least free. And then we average that up for um, each sector. So every state had a sector average score. Then we weighted each sector average score using a statistical analysis called principal components analysis, which weights the sectors according to how much variation there is between the states because it's easier to differentiate um, if you weight um, sectors that had more variation than if they were clumped together. There's not really much use of information there. And then we added up all the average sector, the five average sector weighted rankings across for each state and then ranked them. So that's way more than you ever wanted to know. But anyways, this is how it turned out. This was, again, keep in mind though, this was 2008. This was the last year we did this. Um, and I encourage you to look at, I think Mercatus probably does the index that's closest to the one that we did. Um, but I use mine as an example because it's the one I'm most familiar with. But I think Mercatus is probably the one to look at. Although they do things beyond economic freedom because they look at things like um, you know, drug laws, gambling laws, alcohol laws, although we, we included alcohol laws a little bit, but they get into more kind of personal civil freedom, freedoms that Anthony is actually gonna talk about later today. But as this, you know, pick out your favorite or, or your least favorite state and see where they line up. California, New York, New Jersey, 
Pennsylvania always do very poorly. These rankings don't change a whole lot from year to year, so if we did it today, it probably wouldn't change that much from what you're seeing there. But this is kind of gives you a feel for where your state would rank. Now, in terms of the map, this is what I think it really doesn't change much from year to year, is the map. And the lighter the state color, the least free, the darker, the more free. The freest states tend to be clustered more in the Great Plains and the Rocky Mountains. The least free, of course, California and um, the Northeast, which kind of surprised me is every time we did it is the Southeast didn't come out as economically free as kind of people kind of expect it to be or think it would be based on at least the rhetoric that comes out of the South. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it tended to be just a little bit less than the freer states, which I always thought was interesting. Now, that's kind of the rankings and how we measured economic freedom, but what can you do with it? So I, I thought I'd present like a few kind of fun applications that either other people did or we did ourselves to kind of show how it's a useful concept to explain things in the real world. And so one of the things that was done, not by me, but by Forbes, is they took our economic freedom rankings that we did in 2004, and they looked at the red-blue um, red map and explained uh, how states voted in, in the 2004 election. That was uh, Bush versus Kerry. And it turns out that you can use economic freedom to really explain electoral college outcomes very well. So this is Forbes data, but they showed um, at the presidential level, 23 of the 25 freest states voted for President Bush. And on the other end, 17 of the 25 least free states went with Senator Kerry. So it looks like this in terms of a graph. This is the freest states on the left, the least free on the right. And you can see, you know, it's very red on this side and very blue on the other side. So now don't, don't get me wrong, I don't think people, you know, got from President Bush, you know, more economic freedom. But I, but I think people went into the election perceiving that if they voted for Bush, they would get at least a little bit better outcome than if they voted for Kerry. Um, but it, as you can see, it really does divide along um, how the rules are in each state uh, in terms of economic freedom. So another application is you can use economic freedom to explain where people are moving. So live free or move is the title of this, this slide. And um, what we found is that if you look at um, net domestic migration, net, that excludes you know, foreign immigration, just looking at where US residents, that for every 1,000 people in a state, the freest states got plus 19 new residents for every 1,000, whereas the least free lost 16 per 1,000. So in other words, people are voting with their feet. I mean, they're fleeing the more oppressive states and moving to the, the, the more free states. And of course, they're taking their um, you know, their votes and their money and, and everything else with them. I mean, that means more consumers, more entrepreneurs, um, more, more taxpayers, and, and also um, just, you know, more vigorous economy as more people move in. So, so you can use economic freedom very much to explain, you know, where people are moving to. This was um, 2004, but of course this is carried on to today in New York and California, especially California over the last 20 years, almost without exception, has lost uh, domestic population. It's, it's, it's shrunk. The only reason California's gotten larger is because, because of foreign immigration. So, um, but, but so New York and California, which have bled the most people over the last 20 years, have also been um, you know, at the bottom of the barrel in terms of their economic freedom. So I think people are you know, registering with their feet, their displeasure with rules, especially the more entrepreneurial people, um, and leaving the state. And that's precisely, though, the people you want to keep if you want a vibrant economy, is you want to hold on to the entrepreneurs and, and the go-getters. But I think those are probably the people that are most responsive um, to leaving states for, for better business climates. And so th those are two applications now the other one gets, the other applications that I looked at get much more closer to home, your, your pocketbook. So we looked at um, in both, uh, all, all the editions we did, how much of a, 
impact does economic freedom have on your annual income? So we did a statistical analysis of that. And it turns out we call it the half percent rule because not only have we found this effect, but also um, Heritage also has done a lot of uh, econometric research on this and come up with the same finding. But after controlling for all the other factors you can think of that would impact annual personal income, such as education and wealth and, and um, you know, um, year, uh, years on the job, tenure on the job, that sort of thing, experience, age, uh, schooling, well, that's education. It turns out that um, for every five place improvement in um, your state's economic freedom score, your annual income goes up about a half a percent, which doesn't sound like a lot, but actually I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in the next few slides. It actually turns out to be quite a bit of money over a lifetime. And this is the state effect. So as you improve your economic freedom in your state, um, for example, if you, you'd move up 10 places in our ranking, you'd get a 1% increase in your income. But at the federal level, at the national level, if you look at the research that's been done, you get a much bigger bump. So for example, for a 10% increase in your ranking on that heritage ranking that measures it at the federal level, um, you get about a 7 to 14% increase. So it, it, it's a major, and that's probably because what heritage is measuring at the national level is kind of much more fundamental threats uh, or fundamental impacts in the economy, you know, like, tra like um, trade restrictions and uh, monetary policy and interest rate policy and that sort of thing that has a much more pervasive effect on the total economy. So if you liberalize the economy at that level, you're going to get a much bigger bump to, um, you know, entrepreneurship and new businesses and a more vibrant economy and better incomes as a result. But this has been a very consistent finding, um, not just by us, but by others. So we've coined it the half percent rule. Now, another thing that we looked at is if, well, we compared whatever your state was ranked to the freest state. And so if your state had the same rules that were in the freest state, how much would your income go up? Or in other words, how much are you losing in income because your state isn't as free as the free estate. And it turns out that uh, after you crunch the numbers, um, Rhode Island, I believe it is, yeah, Rhode Island residents suffered the largest reduction in annual income, about $3,600 per year, uh, compared to the free estate, followed by Hawaii, New York, New Jersey. Um, and we called this the oppression tax um, because it's essentially a reduction in your income due to the, the rules in your state that are impeding economic freedom. So, um, and over time, this really adds up. Now, the average across all the states was about $1,100, or 4.42% oppression tax. But over a lifetime, that would add up to, at a 3% interest rate, over a 40-year working career, just at $1,100 every single year, would translate into about $87,000 that, on average, people are losing because of restrictions on their economic freedom. Now, it really goes up if you, you know, assume a higher rate of return on that uh, $1,100 every year. Um, but, but it kind of gives you a feel that with compound interest and that sort of thing, it doesn't require a whole lot um, to add up over time to a significant reduction in your annual income. And again, we're comparing that to the free estate. And the free estate isn't nirvana. I mean, even the free estate can get better. So just think if, if it actually was that original definition that I gave you of what economic freedom is. If we really had a libertopian society with total economic freedom, you can imagine that that difference would be, or that amount would even be higher than it is, probably two or three times higher, possibly. So I think we're, we're paying a heavy price for the loss of economic freedom. And compare that to the median nest egg at retirement in America is just $55,000. So just that little bump up due to you know, improvements in economic freedom would give you more of a return than what most people are gonna you know, save over an entire working career for their retirement. Now, 
Another thing that we did with all this data on economic freedom is Bob Murphy and I, Bob is, is a really great Austrian economist. You've probably seen or heard or read some of his stuff. But we collaborated on this called the Sizzle of Economic Freedom. It's a, it's a report that we did. But essentially what we looked at is um, the, the research that's out there to date on the benefits of economic freedom in the academic literature. So we looked at all the, we tried to find as many studies as we could that looked at the benefits of economic freedom on you know, personal well-being in all of these different areas. And you know, both of us actually were very surprised in terms of how much there was out there. Um, but still, it's, it's a scant amount compared to all the work that's done in all the other areas of economics. So I would really encourage hint, hint, um, you know, people of your age to get more involved in the scholarly side on this issue, if this interests you, because there's really it's so much more that could be done. But I'm just going to briefly, rapidly summarize what we found. But, but uh, that's, I mentioned that already, higher personal income, and this again is at the, you know, the, the federal level, the state le or the national level, that an increase in economic freedom of 10% leads to about a 7 to um, 13, 14% increase in personal income. So it's a huge increase. So economic freedom does, really does translate into you know, higher personal income around the world. Less unemployment, um, because you know, you're, you're able to adjust quicker. Um, you have incentives <laughs> to adjust quicker, unlike in America where we pay, pay people to be unemployed, essentially. Um, in a, in a, in a society of pure economic freedom, you'd have to go out there and, and you know, find something quickly because you don't have this cushion. And so you have a much fuller use of available resources than you would in a, in a less free society. Um, faster economic growth, the growth rates tend to be much faster as economic freedom improves in a country. More macroeconomic stability, greater capital investment and productivity, more business startups, and that, that's probably one of the most important effects, and that's probably been studied the most, is that in, in states with more economic freedom, you see a lot more business startups and much more innovation and entrepreneurship. And um, what's interesting is that the studies have shown that you just have to improve economic freedom within the entire state, you know, create much more business-friendly regulatory tax environment, and you'll get this jump in entrepreneurship and business startups, and that will pull in venture capital and investment to the state. Because op oftentimes, um, politicians have been thinking it the other way. First, we need to get investors to commit to the state, and that will then, then we'll have a pool of money, oftentimes that the politicians want to control, to give to um, potential startups. But it doesn't have to work that way. Actually, it, it, it works better if, um, and, and it works on its own, if you just create you know, a level playing field, a business-friendly environment overall that encourages entrepreneurs to come to your state and start a business. And the venture capitalists will find you. Uh, they're, they're, they're constantly on the lookout for, for new opportunities to invest in, new businesses to expand. And, and so um, they'll do that part for you. So all these kind of public-private ventures or you know, special enterprise zones and special tax incentives to get businesses to move there, uh, the research shows really isn't necessary. You can do it all with just a, you know, an overall improved business climate and, and better rules of the road overall. Um, better educated workforce, um, more you know, school choice, more, more Parental control over the school system um, has shown to be, you know, superior in terms of producing better outcomes for student achievement, less poverty and inequality, better health, better, you know, as you mentioned earlier, greater population inflows, a cleaner environment, and a better quality of life, higher life satisfaction. So they've actually gone out and surveyed people in various countries around the world and asked them you know, their own self-perceived measure of, 
of happiness and self-satisfaction. And, and it turns out people that live in more economically free countries that are able to kind of chart their own course, determine their own destiny, um, are, have a much greater level of, of self-satisfaction and, and a, you know, a feeling of more accomplishment and a better life overall. Um, sir? Uh, just a quick question. Can you expand on the less poverty and inequality considering there's a huge national debate right now about inequality. Right, yeah. Um, well, I was just gonna read actually one thing here that relates to that, and, and probably the best example of this is China, because Chinese, uh, China's government allowed more economic freedom to expand in China than any other Asian country since 1980, according to um, you know, the studies that I cited earlier. And um, so as a result, more than 500 million people in China have lifted themselves out of poverty after the recent pro-market government reforms, um, which allowed you know, new investment, new business startups, um, much more mobility in terms of labor, where you can work and, and allow people to adjust more on their own. Um, greater trade, of course. I mean, they opened up trade to the, to the rest of the world. So, so it's, it's all those things combined, when you liberalize all those areas, you just allow resources then to be used a lot more efficiently. Um, and as a result, I mean, people at a massive scale, probably not seen ever before, you know, 500 million people just since 1980 alone have been raised out of the worst poverty in the world in some cases. You know, less than $2 a day is kind of the measure of the most extreme poverty. Um, so, I mean, that's a huge accomplishment. Did, did that answer your question? Or the inequality? Well, the inequality actually does show that um, in countries that are more economically free, um, there's less inequality from, t from, you know, the percentage of the income going to the top versus the bottom. And, I mean, that's kind of what you'd expect, right? I mean, if, if things are controlled at the top and, uh, and they pick winners and losers, um, they're going to concentrate the winning amongst their friends, usually through you know nationalized industries, you know nationalized steel, nationalized shoes, nationalized ships, whatever. Their friends get the the, the, the reap the profits from those businesses, and um, and you know there's no competition, and there's no ability then to enter those markets and you know outperform, outcompete. And so it turns out that you get a much more of a stark um, income inequality in countries that are much more centralized and, and central planning and less economic freedom. So arguably, the trend towards inequality in America could be attributed to the growth of the government in the state. Right. And I think there's a lot that's been written on that recently in opposition to you know, what you know, Thomas uh, Piketty and, and that crowd and, and you know, of course, Obama is that, um, yeah, I think there's, there's a great case to be made, and it's been made, that you know, the more that government intervenes in outcomes, especially through crony capitalism, picking winners and losers and bailouts and bail-ins and, and that sort of thing that Obama's been doing in, in Bush before him at a massive level, I mean, that, that leads to much more concentrated income or, and, and also a lot more losers on the other end so, um, I mean, as a result, I mean, I think the income distribution is completely rigged and completely affected by all of these government programs from top to bottom. So, I mean, there's no way to take the income distribution in America and, and consider that some sort of meritocracy, you know, as a result of, you know, fair and efficient competition. It's, it's not. From top to bottom, it's, it's rigged at some point or another. Um, so let, let, me, let me just wrap this up before we get to questions, because I'm, I'm almost there. So what are the two approaches to, um, and, and there are kind of two primary approaches to expanding economic freedom. So one is um, a constitutional approach. And I worked a few years ago on a constitutional amendment for the state of Missouri. And this, this is it right here. Uh, I don't know if any states have ever done this, and it didn't go very far. I mean, it died in committee, of course, but I mean, it's the beginning of, of I think, in, injecting within the, con the state constitution an explicit protection of economic freedom. And, 
And this reads that all persons have a natural right to economic freedom. So I don't know of any other states that's tried to do something like this. And I think this is worthy. I mean, you can come up and read this later if you want. But I think this is you know, one approach that some people are considering as a way to not only protect what they have, but also you know, expand economic freedoms going forward. Um, so there's the, the, the constitutional approach that would give equal protection to economic freedom as uh, you know, the same status and protection as the other political and civil freedoms that we enjoy in, in the country, freedom to vote, freedom of association, press, religion, um, due process, that sort of thing. So it would explicitly embed into the Constitution um, a clause that would protect economic freedom. Now, of course, that would have to be defined exactly what that would mean, and courts are great at um, tweaking these sorts of things. Uh, but anyways, I mean, it is, it, it is a concerted approach to explicitly address this freedom, which I think is as fundamental as any of these other freedoms that are up there, um, as important, probably more important actually in some respects, um, because without the freedom of to chart your own course and, and, you know, and keep what you've earned and that sort of thing, you're always under a threat of having your property confiscated and, and it kind of restricts your ability to speak out if you think that the, uh, you know, the, the king is going to confiscate all your property if you do so. So, I mean, I think economic freedom in a way is a, is a precursor or protector of all the other freedoms that, that we have or should have. Um, so this is one approach. Um, Missouri, as I said, tried it. This was, I think, 2010 that I worked on this with them. And um, unfortunately, it didn't go very far. But it, it could be resurrected, and other states could consider it. And the other approach is, um, is rather than trying to reform what we have in America and try to get back to some semblance of economic freedom, um, why not just make it easier to escape oppression? So that's kind of the alternative approach. And, and that's kind of the idea behind you know, seasteading. I don't know if you've heard of seasteading. Peter Thiel is kind of behind that. Um, and then you have Michael Strong, who's behind um, the Free Cities Project. But essentially, it's the idea that, I mean, I think we have like 180, 190 countries in the world. Why not have 2,000, 3,000 countries? What's, what's, what's optimal about 180? Uh, so why not just let 1,000 nations bloom? Let people try a lot of different things. And so the seasetting approach is, for example, to create platforms. Here's, here's a picture of one, you know, out in international waters that um, in each platform would kind of be its own country that would establish its own rules. People could try different things, see what worked. People could try um, different things, see what attracted people to or, or capital to them. But, um, but the idea is let's not just restrict it to these 180 countries that we have today. Let's open it up, allow people to kind of create their own little states, their own little constitutions, and um, you know, let's, let's flourish, let's have true competition at the national level. So that's the other approach. Um, and um, I know Michael Strong, they, they, they thought they had an agreement, maybe somebody knows more about this than I do in the room, but I think they thought they had an agreement with the government of Honduras, if I'm not mistaken, to create a free city or free state inside of Honduras. And, um, I mean, they got right to the bitter end. They thought they had it, and then the government backed away from it, as I understand it. I think they're still working on it. Are they? It's not completely dead? Yeah. OK. I think it was looking positive. It will blow very well. See, the problem with that approach is you've got to get the you know, acquiescence of the hosting country. Whereas seasteading, you don't. There's no country. You just got to worry about pirates and stuff like that. But, which could be just as, as big of a barrier. But, um, but anyways, yeah, see, that's kind of the flaw with that model. But, but you know, they, they've kind of, I think, based it on, um, you know, Dubai and how they've carved out, you know, that international trade center that has kind of autonomy and things like that. But, you know, again, it's, it's a start. You got to start somewhere. You got to start thinking entrepreneurially and creatively about this stuff. And I think, um, 
you know, there's, there's a lot of great minds and, and maybe even more importantly, big money behind a lot of these ideas. So, and I think they're, they're just in their infancy and I think they'll, um, you know, gain more attraction and more credibility the, the more that we talk about it. But I invite you to go to the Seasteading website and they have pictures of all these different, they held a contest to design these platforms and, and some of them are really elaborate and creative and kind of just fun to think about. So anyways, um, so th those are kind of the two opposing models or approaches to advance or protect or secure greater economic freedom. It's the constitutional protection approach versus you know, kind of this let a thousand nations bloom competitive approach. Um, all right, that's, that's my spiel, but I, I welcome questions. Thank you. And I welcome applause, too. <laughs> Uh, there first, and then back there. You mentioned the uh, half percent improvement for every like five ranks. Right. Did that account for uh, cost of living too? In the least free state. Um. Most free state? Right. Yeah, it did. It did. Yeah, it was real. It was real income. Oh, I was going to ask if it was C as in the letter or C as in this one. Uh, C as in C. S E A. C steady. It's one word. Okay. Sea study, like homesteading kind of, but sea study. I don't know. I was trying to do a little bit. Is it Patrick Hoover? Pardon? Is it Patrick Hoover? Yeah. Yeah. Between his grandson. Yeah. Well, actually, though, he, I don't know what the story is behind that, but he's no longer executive director of it. Somehow, no, somehow he got pushed out. So, uh, yeah, I don't know who's in charge of it now. It's always been kind of rough seas there, it seems like, to use a bad analogy. But, um, but it's still an idea worthy of you know, further exploration. Yes? Um, I guess I'm glad you brought up these two approaches to expanding economic freedom. Um, you know, after talking in our last talk about uh, you know, the amount of power and self-interest that you know, government officials have in passing laws and regulations and economically, um, it doesn't seem as if economic freedom is in the best interest of the right. government, right? So right. it's no uh, surprise that in 2010 the amendment in Missouri was shot down. Right. I, just, I, I guess it's not really a question, but it's just like a comment, I guess. Of, like, it just kind of seems hopeless, doesn't it? Well, I've been doing this 20 years, and I have some days that seem hopeless, let, let me tell you. But no, I mean, I don't think, I mean, I'm not a fatalist. You know, I think there's still, there's hope. I mean, I think Ivan said you can't change it from the inside. I think I heard that just when I first came in through the door. I, I mean, I think he's right. I mean, I think you got to, and these, both these approaches I mentioned could be on, coming from the outside. You know, either through entrepreneurs with seasteading approach, let a thousand nations bloom type of thing, or um, from the outside, from the people directly. So in Missouri, maybe you have to go through the legislature to put a constitutional amendment on the ballot. I don't know. You don't have to do that in California. Um, so you can go around the legislature. You can go around the governor, um, and the people can directly just through you know signatures. If you get enough signatures, uh, you can put a ballot initiative on. So. Um, so it varies by state, um, but but yeah, there's there's some dark days that I go through thinking like, how do you get out of this predicament? Right. Well, and especially yeah. because when, especially when you you know implement a tax, it's so hard to get that tax removed. Once right. something gets into the law, it takes ten times as much energy to get it out. Right. So, yeah, you're right. Well, China, you know, China's an interesting example though because I think. You know, obviously, the, they didn't vote on it as we think about it in terms of voting, but they made massive changes, and I think it's because they, they saw the threat that if they didn't change things, the entire system would collapse. There would just be a, a revolution in the streets. You know, I think Tiananmen really struck fear in their hearts, and they saw the future there if they didn't try to make some changes, and although the changes that it were, they were already making changes before Tiananmen Square, but but I think that really did kind of solidify the position that we got to make some changes or this whole thing's going to collapse. 
just like the Soviet Union. Um, I mean, those two examples are actually quite remarkable in that there wasn't a whole lot of bloodletting to get those changes made, although, you know, now Russia's backsliding a lot. But, um, but so I think, you know, you can't, it depends on the country, of course. Here, I mean, I don't think you're going to have a revolution because people are just, you know, they're, they're, you know, fat and happy here in America, you know. I don't think you, it's, it would take an awful lot to get people on the streets with guns and, you know, to overthrow the government in America. Um, and other people, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, on my own. I've read a lot of people have said that, that we're just a very contented society because we're doing so well compared to, you know, the past and most of how people live around the world. So I think it will have to take more of an approach like this, either a constitutional approach from the outside, from the people directly. And this has happened in California. I mean, Prop 13, major tax revolt. Um, that's lived to today, um, and then or through entrepreneurship. Entrepre I still think entrepreneurship is probably, you know, offers the best hope long term. It just has to, you know, has to be done very creatively and somehow, you know, work out the the problems about protection and problems about you know governments intruding on, on what they've carved out. Um, but you know that's. That's always a possibility, and I think the best possibility is probably some sort of entrepreneurial approach. Um, and I heard uh, Rebecca say that you are really involved in like the free city project, right? Mm, no. Um, no. Not really. No. Um, oh, sorry. Well, you did the Plan Bay area. Oh, uh, yeah, Smart Grow? What's that? Oh, that's um, this whole kind of sustainable development idea that regional governments should determine. Uh, master plans for transportation, land use, housing going forward. So kind of a master plan of how development should go moving forward over the next, you know, 40, 50 years. So oftentimes it's kind of unelected regional governments that are superimposed on local governments that then force upon them these plans in terms of roads and highways and and uh, housing and, and commercial development, that sort of thing. Um, and it's all kind of due around reducing greenhouse gas emissions and that. So it's separate. <laughs> but it's still, it's very anti-economic freedom. <laughs> Sir? Uh, is there anything else? Are you from Belgium, by the way? No. <laughs> OK, you can ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, is there anything the government can do to further economic freedom besides emphasizing rule of law and like, property rights? Is there something else that you found in your studies that governments did that helped economic freedom? Mm, well, I mean, like we mentioned, Prop 13, you know, there's various constitutional protections that help a lot. Um, of course, the tax code goes a long ways towards advancing economic freedom. I mean, South, South Dakota probably has the most libertarian, or the closest to the libertopian tax code you can have. Um, they, ha they don't have an income tax, corporate or, or personal, um, uh, no inheritance tax, I don't believe. I mean, I think it's almost like a purely a consumption tax, sales tax model. So. Um, so there are some states that do various things very well. There's not one state that kind of has combined it all, but, um, but you could take a, you know, a best of and cherry pick from all the various states and you'd have a you know, very good model for what to do. Uh, what, what surprised me is though some of the states, as I mentioned, in, in the uh, southeast and even Texas in some respects doesn't come in as well as you'd think they would given the rhetoric and the media and that sort of thing. Um, Texas actually has a fairly big government in terms of the size of government for the state is fairly large. But it's just that they're very entrepreneurial. I mean, they, they steal a lot of businesses from a lot of states, including California. Yes? Alaska would be too. I would never thought Alaska would get the bottom five. Yeah. 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 Again, they, they have a big state government because they skim off so much of the oil yeah. revenues. So they don't have like an income tax, but they have huge, you know, severance tax, and then they use that to prop up the, the state government. 
Yes. Um, for a box that I've never beheld them, but don't, um, don't they get incentivized to move up there and to continue living there? So would those things be uh, accounted for when you were doing Incentivized by the companies or by no, government? No, the state, the government. The government. I, I, I don't know yeah. very much about that. I don't know about that. They have a reverse income tax kind of thing. Like you get like a Credit. Like your earned income credit? Yeah. Oh, okay. $10,000 for every person in this family who lives in Alaska. Okay. Well, that would be a magnet then. But that would be very anti-economic freedom. But it would be a magnet for drawing people that you probably would rather not draw, right? I mean, you want the more entrepreneurial people, not the people who are going to live off the state. I think it has to do with them filling the Yes. So I was just gonna we'll just kind of try on this Alaska talk. Um, there's an article I read called like the myth of Alaska. And you've got this idea of Alaska being kind of like frontier, all the really tough people living up there. Um, but in, in fact, it's like a really crappy place to live. It's like super <laughs> cold and really hard. And uh, so the, like the federal are... subsidies like per person in Alaska are massive. Mm -hmm. and state subsidies are massive just because it's such a bad poor place to live that, and so far away from everything else that it takes a massive amount of spending to be able to even make it possible. Well, of course, right now, you know, the state that's booming is North Dakota. And that's, you know, I'm from Minnesota, so I know what it's like up there. And, you know, it's miserable, but it's such a boom. I mean, they can't build housing fast enough. In fact, one of the cities up there has the highest uh, rent per square foot, higher than San Francisco. It's like $2,600 or something for just like 600 square feet? It's like a storage shed you get for that. But yeah, it's, you know, it's booming. And um, because of the is the Bakken oil shale, yeah. Oh, what's that say? Seven minutes, okay. Any more questions? Going once, twice, no? Okay, thank you. <laughs>